Hi everyone, my name is Matthew Hunt. I'm the staff microscopist here at the KNI. This is our third lecture in our series on uh, microscopy. So we did scanning electron microscopy two weeks ago, gallium focused ion beam microscopy last week, and today is helium and neon focused ion beam microscopy. So if you're not familiar with helium and neon microscopy, it looks pretty similar to what we've seen with our other scanning beam microscopy. So this is what it looks like when we scan a helium beam over the sample. We scan in two dimensions. Uh, this is 1,000 by 1,000 pixels, 0.5 microsecond per pixel, and we're getting an image just like you would get in an electron microscope. And if we zoom in, I want you to pay attention to the field of view here, 1.5 microns. So we're able to get really high resolution images pretty effortlessly using the helium ion beam. So here we're scanning 10 microseconds per pixel. In 10 seconds, we're going to capture this really nice image. And if I pause here, I just want to point out that one of the things that we'll talk about is we get great depth of field and great resolution at the same time. That's not something that's common with a scanning electron microscope. So that's a, a main thing that we're going to talk about today. And if I resume the video, uh, what we're going to do is go back to scanning a little more quickly. I'm going to double click on this. These are multi-walled carbon nanotubes. So I'm going to zoom in on it. Now our field of view is only 300 nanometers. And I'm going to grab another picture, slow down the frame rate. And in five seconds, we'll capture a picture of this single nanotube, make a measurement on it. And we'll see that this one is about four nanometers. So this is going to be a pretty uh, important thing for us to build towards as we understand how do we get a picture where we can get uh, images of, say, four nanometer features. And then later, I'll show you even how we can do lithography on a similar scale. OK? Uh, and just as a precursor to what I'm going to go into, this is a similar picture of the same sample, the multi-walled carbon nanotubes taken with the helium ion microscope. And this is what it would look like in one of our SEMs. And I'm trying really hard there to get good resolution. And based on the charge state of the sample, and some other considerations. We just don't have nearly the, the depth of field that we have here. It's all kind of flattened out. We can see features that are on the order of single nanometers, but we can't get the depth of field at the same time like we can do here. And we can see this really beautiful tangled uh, array of, of nanotubes. So now I want to start by showing some applications and examples from both our lab and other labs around the world. Uh, I've already mentioned we can do great imaging. So this is a 300 nanometer field of view. These are chromium grains. And each one of these is about 7 nanometers. So we can get really nice detail on those. We even see little boundaries and little grooves and facets on those on the order of uh, you know, a few nanometers. Uh, down here, I mentioned helium lithography. So we published this just last year, where we were able to write lines that are about 5 nanometers wide. And then not only that, but we were able to, to transfer the pattern via etch and maintain about a 6 nanometer uh, silicon fin. We did it with silicon and with tungsten. And that's now the new sort of record for smallest features made in silicon with sort of conventional lithography. Here I'm saying helium is conventional because it's a scan, uh, conventional scanning beam, even though most lithography is, is electron beam. Uh, we can use helium to mill patterns. So here, we're milling graphene into graphene nanoribbons by, by cutting a, an array of rectangles. We leave behind a network of nanoribbons. Down here, we're using the neon focused ion beam not to remove material directly all the way th through. This is a 60 nanometer aluminum pad. But rather, we're doing a form of hard mask lithography. So I'll show later how we can put something like a very thin layer of atomic layer deposited aluminum oxide, use that as a hard mask and use neon to stencil that hard mask and then transfer the pattern. We can do helium imaging of highly non-conductive specimens. So here's a suspended silicon nitride waveguide. And so it's insulating, it's suspending, it's suspended. And there's actually two sides of this. I'll show a, an example later of how we use the electron flood gun to balance the otherwise accumulating positive charge of the incident helium ion beam. And then we have a gallium focused ion beam on the system as well. So we can cut cross sections and then get really nice images using the helium beam. Uh, here, this field of view, I believe, is about 500 nanometers. We're looking at a, a cross section of nanoporous gold. 
Here are some other applications from other labs around the world. People use helium to punch really small pores into membranes. So I think these pores are on the order of three or five nanometers. And then you can do things like pass DNA through it. And lots of companies are, are working on using uh, these very small pores as filters. There's a group in Riverside, uh, Shane Seibert's group, where they, they take YBCO superconducting films and they trace the helium beam over that. And the damage that you impart with the helium is just enough to disrupt the superconductivity. And you can use this to form a Josephson junction. Uh, down here up at Intel, they're using neon to repair photo masks at a really small scale. And they're also using it to do what's called circuit editing. So they kind of can rewire a chip, do some surgery on it to test something that they want to uh, employ in maybe the next generation of their, their fabrication. Using that electron flood gun, we can image biological samples, which are otherwise not very conductive. And we can get really nice images. Uh, here's a 100 nanometer scale bar. So this is about a micron. And we're seeing porosity on the order of tens of nanometers here. We can use the neon beam to do final thinning on TEM lamella samples in order to get atomic resolution TEM images. And you can, if you're doing scanning probe microscopy, you can use helium or neon to kind of uh, brush up or, or change the, the end of a, of a tip for, say, your, your AFM application. We don't have something like energy dispersive spectroscopy with helium because uh, for reasons I'll go over later. So if you want to get elemental contrast, we use secondary ion mass spectroscopy. So we don't have this in the K&I, but there's labs around the world, primarily Oak Ridge is doing a lot of work with this right now, where they're using the second ion mass spectrometer to get resolution on the order of uh, tens of nanometers, so chemical contrast. Uh, lots of people use the helium beam to cut really narrow gaps. So if you're making plasmonic devices, here's an example of cutting a four nanometer gap between these two antennae. And then here are split ball resonators with about a 15 nanometer gap cut with helium. And then we don't have a gas injection system on our system, but you can have precursor gases and then interact those precursor gases with the helium beam, with the neon beam, to do deposition of metal and oxide, depending on what that precursor is. So in front of you, you have two handouts. One are the physical concepts that are underlying the what we call the GFIS column, gas field ion source, uh, and the, uh, all the parameters that are associated with using the helium microscope. And then the other handout you have pertains to the alignments that we do when we use the, the GFIS column and, and system. And that's, when I say GFIS, I mean for helium or neon. We'll see how they, they come from the same uh, optical axis. As I've been doing throughout these lectures, I like to draw analogies between the different scanning beam systems. So the relevant textbooks are here for SEM, gallium-focused ion beam, and this one's for helium ion microscopy, though we can also learn a little bit about neon in there as well. And we can draw analogies between the emission sources. So we've talked about a field emission gun and a liquid metal ion source for SEM and gallium fib, respectively. And today we'll talk about how this, this gas field ion source operates. And one of the things we'll see is that each one of these has a tungsten needle. And then we're going to have some kind of extraction uh, voltage. And uh, we're going to be able to form a beam of a different species. So they're basically similar construction. Again, extraction voltage, accelerating potential, uh, but otherwise there are little intricacies that are important for understanding the physics of how we create these beams. We'll also see that the column optics are fairly similar. We talked about electromagnetic lenses with an SEM. When we're using ion beams, we use electrostatic lenses. And so this is an Einzel lens. This is the, the little um, the icon I'm using for an Einzel lens. But we'll see that the, the basic construction is the same. The only thing that's really different is we don't have steering optics in the middle of a gallium fib column. When we go to helium and neon fib, we get these steering optics back, just like we had with SEM. And it's really the same exact column, just a difference between electromagnetic and electrostatic lenses. I want to show you what it looks like, uh, our microscope in the lab. So 
here is our, our microscope and then our, our desktop setup. And I'll point out all the different parts of this in a moment. We have a, what's called a vacuum screen when you use the system. Uh, this is our Zeiss Orion Nanofab. This is the, the number one commercial uh, microscope for helium and neon. While other companies are creating them, Zeiss got in early and they've been selling these for uh, a little over a decade. All right, so in our vacuum screen, we can see the, the vacuum diagram. So here's our, our GFIS column. We form our helium or neon beam at the top, and that's on our main optical axis. Our system has a gallium focused ion beam that's 54 degrees offset. So this looks just like your SEM gallium fib, except we replace SEM with helium and neon. And then we can look at other things here, like the particulars of the GFIS column and the gallium column. And then when you're at the system, you can look at everything that's happening with the, the load lock that we have for transferring samples and other things like the gas box, how we deliver gas to the source. These are our two columns. So this is our GFIS column. And uh, we'll see different parts of this. I'll show why we have an infrared camera that's set up to point at the tip. Uh, here's our, our gallium column, 54 degrees offset from the GFIS column. And you can see an array of ion getter pumps that are used to pump the system. If we look at it from different angles, we see there's a, a bottle of helium gas on this side. And then on the other side is a bottle of neon gas. And depending on which beam species we want to create, we turn on that gas and it flows up into the source. And I'll tell you how we then ionize that gas and form a beam. Uh, something that's important here is we have a liquid nitrogen doer. And I'll mention later when I explain the source why we want to be at cryogenic temperatures in order to form these helium and neon ion beams. All right, I mentioned we have a load lock. So our load lock allows us to transfer a sample in about two minutes time. Uh, so this is what it looks like when we pull the sample out. We have a specimen holder. Here's our stub with a couple of chips on it. And we close that and then transfer the sample. If we take a look with the gate valve open, we have our transfer arm that puts the, the holder onto the stage. And then here's our GFIS column. Here's our Everhart Thornley detector, which you'll be familiar with from SEM and gallium fib. So we're using the same type of detector to form our images. And then in behind it is our gallium focus ion beam column. If we look at a schematic of our chamber, then it's similar to what we've looked at before with SEM and gallium fib. On this system, our eucentric height is 9.1 millimeters. And we have videos on YouTube where we explain what eucentric height is and how to get to it. Uh, what that means is it's just the, the plane in the chamber where at any tilt angle, if your sample is at that plane, you can see the same thing at any tilt. So if, I, if I'm at zero degrees or 54 degrees, I'm looking at the same feature on my chip. And this is something that we try to usually go to eucentric height for most applications, especially when we want to tilt. OK, and what I wanted to show here is that the working distance is about 9.1 millimeters at eucentric height from the perspective of the helium or neon ion beam, and about 14 millimeters from the perspective of the gallium ion beam. And both will generate secondary electrons that are used to form the image. OK, so here's our gas field ion source. It has a atomically sharp tungsten needle in it with the 111 plane, and we hold this this tip at positive potential so that when we flow in helium gas, if it gets close enough to the tip, an electron will tunnel from the helium atom to the tip, thus ionizing the, the helium into making it a helium ion. And then what we have is an extraction field set up here. So uh, the extraction field actually is what is responsible for ionizing. So we, by having an extraction, by having an electric field at the tip, at the, the sharp end of the tip, we have the field is strongest there. So that's where we're going to get the most ionization happening. Uh, so once we ionize, then we also have an accelerating voltage set up so that we can accelerate those ions down the column. Now, the way this works is we have two power supplies, accelerating voltage and extractor. The extraction field is set by the difference between these power supplies. Uh, 
And then the accelerating potential, which gives our ions the energy that they have, is set by the accelerating power supply. So if we have 30 kV on that power supply, we'll get 30 keV ions heading down the column. And what's important here is that this is all cryogenic temperature. So we have a liquid nitrogen dewer, which is about 78, 79 Kelvin. We pump on it, and through evaporative cooling, we lower the temperature down to about 59 Kelvin, and it becomes what they say is sort of like a solid nitrogen porous block of material. So if this is 59, then our source ends up being about 79. And so our ionization rate of helium is, is higher at low temperature. Uh, we don't want to go too, too low because then it, it starts going the other way. But right around here, 79 degrees, we get uh, optimum ionization of our gas. And at the very end of that tip, I mentioned it's atomically sharp. So we often call it a, a trimer. So we have three atoms at the very end of the tip. It's that, that sharp. And that's why we can concentrate the electric field there and get this ionization of our gas. So we have our source at the top. We saw our extractor. Then the beam enters the first condenser lens. There's just one of them on this system. Sometimes on SEM, you might have multiple condenser lenses. And the condenser lens is responsible for crossing the beam over so that when it's over the aperture, uh, we can change how much current ends up flowing through that aperture. And I'll show examples of that. So in the mid column, we have quadrupoles that are responsible for steering the beam down the column. Here we have. Uh, a beam selection aperture, which will choose the larger the aperture, will let through more current. And whatever current passes through then goes through these, these octopoles. And those are responsible for both scanning the beam in two dimensions over the surface, or as we'll see in any arbitrary pattern if we're doing something like lithography or milling. And they also, the octopoles change the, the shape of the beam. So if we have astigmatism, that means we have an elliptically shaped beam. We want to use the stigmaters to get it back to a circular size, and that's how we get to a nice small probe size. Lastly, it enters the objective lens, what we call lens two on the system, and that's responsible to, for forming it into a small probe that then scans over the surface. So we'll take a closer look at the tip here. Uh, these gas field ion sources have been around since the 50s. This is actually the first time that atoms were imaged. Uh, this guy, uh, Muller, he had a, a tungsten needle, just like we have, and he held it at positive potential and cooled it down and flowed in some helium gas, just like we're doing here. And the gas would ionize at all the different atoms around the, the profile or the, the edge of that tip. And so each atom ends up forming a little beamlet of helium ions, and those went down to a fluorescent screen and lit it up, and that's how we got, or how they got that image of single atoms. And so that's very useful, and so we can start with a tungsten tip in our system, just like they did, but what we'll end up doing is making it sharper, because we don't want many beamlets, we want as few beamlets as we can get, so that all the gas that's up there is being ionized by just a few atoms, and therefore we get maximum brightness coming from our source. So we do a, what's called a source build, and that forms a three-sided pyramid at the end of the tip. And we do that by heating it and applying an electric field, and the settings for that are sort of controlled within the software. And you can see the temperature time profile here during the source build, it takes about 15 minutes. Uh, and then we look at that tip with an infrared camera so that we can monitor the temperature during this process. And so that forms a three-sided pyramid, but then ultimately we want to get to uh, a trimer, or maybe sometimes a dimer or a monomer, a single atom. So it usually looks like this after you do a source build. You can see the, the three-sided nature of that pyramid. And then in order to get from there to here, we're going to use what's called field evaporation. So we're going to start increasing the extraction field until we start ripping off tungsten atoms. And plane by plane, we're going to go until we can get on the 111 plane three atoms that are sort of stabilizing each other, each of which are emitting a beamlet. And since they're perched at the very end of the tip, they're going to be the ones ionizing the mo most of the gas. You might have some stray atoms that are also ionizing a little bit, but most of our current is going to be coming from these atoms. Uh, we, what we do is we can uh, 
and I'll show a video of this in a moment, but we can, uh, we, we rip off these atoms as, as high as say like negative 40, negative 45 kV, and then we'll bring it back down when we operate to something like negative 32.5 kV, and this will be the optimum extraction voltage, what we call best imaging extraction voltage, so that we get the most brightness possible from these atoms. So the process of forming the tip, the, the source build is automatic, but the, the forming of the trimer ends up being uh, something of a manual process. And so I'm going to show you what it looks like, and this is called scanning field ion microscope mode. So you're seeing the three-sided pyramid, here's some tungsten atoms, and what I'm doing is I'm changing right now lens one. So I'm, the condenser lens is just taking all this, uh, this signal and it's, I'm actually able to, to magnify the source that way. So by magnifying in, I can see just a handful of atoms there. There's maybe five or six of them here. And then what I'm going to start to do is take the extraction voltage and start driving it more negative and you'll see atoms getting ripped off. So that's the field of apparition. So we're ripping off atoms from around the tip and ultimately we want to clean up the very end form until we get to a trimer. And so this is a very slow process but you're seeing it in real time here. So I know I want to pick off, say that last atom, it's gone and now I have three and then I bring the extraction voltage back down to a safe level where I'm not going to field evaporate any more tungsten. And now I'm at more, more of like a best imaging extraction voltage where you see these three atoms are lighting up more than any others. Okay. All right, so that's how we form the, the trimer. Uh, and I'll talk about why that ends up being important to have a, a single atom source. All right, so here, we've seen this in the other lectures, our electromagnetic lens for, for electrons, our electrostatic Einzel lens for ions. Uh, in electromagnetic, we run current through a wire. We leak the magnetic field out into the column. We have stronger field at the perimeter, weaker field in the middle, and that allows us to bend all of our electrons to a crossover or a focal point. And in Einzel lens, we do it symmetrically. We, we accelerate and decelerate the beam as it passes through the lens. We hold the middle plate, and these are sort of, think of these as circular plates. Uh, the middle plate's at positive potential, top and bottom are at zero potential, and we are able to form these electric field lines. So again, accelerate, decelerate the ions as they pass through the lens. We know that ions in an electric field will change their energy, so we have to be symmetric with how we accelerate and decelerate, but ultimately what ends up happening is we get the same effect. The ions that are off axis get bent more strongly back to the middle and those on axis don't and we end up coming to a crossover or a focus point. I showed how in an SEM objective lens we run current through this wire or, or through this lens and we get the field to come out and our objective lens plane is here at the bottom of the column. In an uh, electrostatic lens we just stick it at the bottom of the column and and we're able to have our objective lens plane there. I mentioned in the SEM lecture that in order to really improve resolution, we turn on what's called an immersion mode. So we have another wire coil that's outside of the, the iron uh, pole piece, we call it. And that allows us to have a magnetic field that permeates the chamber. And if we look at those field lines and where they come together, your objective lens plane ends up being somewhere between the bottom of the column and the sample. So that minimizes your effective working distance, which forms a smaller probe size and allows us to get better resolution. And so for reasons I'll go over, we don't need to pull those tricks when we're using helium. Uh, so we just have the Einzel lens, and um, when you do immersion mode, that ends up killing your depth of field to get resolution. Here, we're going to be able to get a probe size that's about a half a nanometer in size and we're not going to ruin our depth of field, so we'll be able to take dramatic images like I showed you with those nanotubes earlier. The way that we control current in the, the GFIS column is three, we do it in three ways. So the first way is just by changing the gas pressure at the source. If we have more gas at the source, we'll get more ionization events that happen. So the current will scale linearly with the gas pressure. 
Uh, the second way is by changing the aperture size. So just by changing the physical hole or physical aperture in the system, we can pass more current through it. And we have a strip here, or aperture strip. We have different apertures for helium and for neon. So for helium, it's their gold apertures. In neon are molybdenum, because we want a harder material molybdenum to prevent these apertures from wearing out more quickly with the higher sputter rate of the neon beam. And then the third way that we do it is by changing, as I said before, the condenser lens. So if we're in a very weak state with our condenser lens, then we might get our, our beam to cross over at the aperture plane. So that means we're going to slide all of that current through and down to the sample. We'll have a high current beam. If we go to a more positive voltage on our Einzel lens, we move that crossover point up in the column. So now our beam spreads over the aperture, and we'll get less current passing through. And then if we continue to increase the positive voltage of that lens, we move the crossover point up higher. Our beam is more spread, and we'll get uh, less current through. Now, when you do this, what happens is you're spreading your beam so that you're, you're kind of getting rid of your off-axis ions. So the only ones that we're handling are ones that were on axis to begin with. And so when they enter the objective lens, they're going to be able to get formed down to a small point because we don't want our ions to be really spread across the, the lens. That makes it harder to bend them back into a single point. So this is the way that we spread the beam, get on-axis ions down so that the objective lens can handle them better. And you can see here the uh, different uh, relationships that we have. So as we, uh, as we decrease the current we decrease the probe diameter, which increases our resolution, but we sacrifice by having less signal available to us. Or if you're milling, less sputter rate. OK, and so here again, we see our three columns side by side. And again, just pointing out that we have basically borrowed the exact same construction for GFIS as we had for SEM. All right, so now it's important to go through the uh, beam specimen interactions in the probe. Um, so I've shown a similar slide in the other lecture. So it's all, all kind of comes down to you have an accelerating voltage, you have some probe current, and you have a probe convergence angle. And those three parameters conspire to give you a probe size. You can look at the relevant equations related to the different aberrations in the system. So chromatic aberrations, spherical aberrations, uh, and when you add up the, the contribution to the probe size from all these different equations, you get your final probe size here. So you can always kind of look into these equations and see how we're able to measure uh, or predict our, our probe size. Here are some plots from Zeiss when they were constructing these systems. So you can see the contributions of all the different uh, aberrations. So there's diffraction and spherical aberrations and chromatic. And depending on the half angle of the beam, we can change the probe size. So when you add all these things together, we see the total beam diameter. And the half angle that we end up usually operating at here puts us at around 0.4 nanometers for about a 30 kV half a picoamp helium beam. If we bump that up to 20 picoamps, then we're going to get more contributions um, from uh, from our aberrations, and our probe size is about 0.8, but still sub-nanometer, which is way better than you're going to do with, say, an SEM, where 2 to 3 nanometers is about what you're looking at, even in an immersion lens mode. I had the same slide in the gallium fib presentation. And any time we interact a focused ion beam with a sample, we'll have a number of events that are described here. So. First, we're, we're going to knock out secondary electrons, and those are what we'll use to form an image. We'll also, of course, sputter away atoms, and that can be used to mill material. Uh, and then we'll also have ions implanting at some depth that's proportional to the, the energy that those ions have. And we'll get some amorphization of the material in that damage zone. Here we can look at the different sputter radii between gallium and then helium. So your gallium IMB might be formed down to 5, 7 nanometers, but the sputter radius is going to be much larger, sort of 
on the order of, uh, say, 10 nanometer radius. Whereas with the helium beam, that probe size we saw is about a half nanometer, our sputter radius is only going to be on the order of single nanometers. So this allows you to, to cut features that are four or five nanometers in size. It's important to note the relative sputter rate of our different beam species. So if we consider helium to be 1x, then neon, which is of course a heavier species, is about 30x, and gallium is 60x. And then on top of that, we can consider the current range over which we operate. So helium, I say here, about 0.1 picoamps is the smallest we can do for, say, some lithography uh, applications. And I, I put it up to 100 picoamps. We can really run the column about 300, but your, your resolution goes away pretty quickly up there. Compare that with gallium, where one picoamp is about the, le the least you can get, and you can go up to about 100 nanoamps. So you have orders of magnitude more current with a much higher sputter rate, and that means for gallium, you can remove orders of magnitude larger amounts of volume if you're using this to sputter. Uh, so really, we think about helium, neon, and gallium. When it comes to milling, you can think of them as like different drill bits. You know, your gallium is your, your heavy drill bit, neon is intermediate, and helium is, is a really fine, fine one. All right, now to draw more analogies to electron beams, here I showed beam specimen interactions for an SEM from 30 kV, 10, and 2 kV. So it's about 8 microns deep at 30 kV in silicon. Uh, and in an SEM, we can look at the interaction volume and see that there's topographic contrast, electrons coming from the top, secondary electrons. We have backscattered electrons and characteristic x-rays. So those are the different uh, contrast mechanisms, mecha mechanisms that we have. Topographic, atomic number, elemental contrast. And there's some voltage contrast, too, that we can see. Um, and then here, in a, a helium ion beam at 30 kV, our interaction volume is about 500 nanometers. So we're at orders of magnitude smaller interaction. And then the other thing I'll point out here is that the amount of signal that we generate is also order of magnitude or more greater than we can get with the electron beam. So with a, with a much smaller probe current, we can get just as much signal that we would get from SEM, where we might operate on the scale of tens to hundreds of picoamps is pretty low for SEM. For helium, low is more on the order of tenths of a picoamp. Uh, but we don't have our, our interaction volume that's not filled with different colors like I have over there. So really, we're getting mostly secondary electrons. So it's good for topographic contrast. But we're not going to be able to get any backscattered ions to show atomic number contrast, for instance. And in the, one of the early slides, I said, if we want elemental contrast, then we have to do SIMS, the secondary ion mass spectroscopy. And then by voltage contrast, I mean if you build up some charge on the sample, that changes the ability for secondary electrons to escape. And that can change then how bright or dark your image ends up being. So if we look at what's happening from a, a charge balance perspective, at high voltage in an SEM, we have current going in and, and not that much current coming out as secondary electron signal. When we lower the voltage, we get progressively more secondary electron signal coming out until eventually we're able to get sort of like a charge equilibrium by getting signal out to match about what we're putting in. In a helium ion beam system, we're always putting in positive charge and getting out negative secondary electrons. So we can't pull the same trick here of lowering the voltage. So if you're going to do imaging, we'll see most of the time you're locked in around 30 kV, because you just want the high energy for a small probe and high resolution. And we'll have to do something else to balance the charge. And we'll, we'll go over that in a minute. Uh, now here, I want to also show what we have interaction volumes that we simulate with Casino software, the interaction volume for electron beam, uh, the common software that's free that you can download for helium ions is SRIM. And if we really zoom in in the top, say, 25 nanometers here, we see how narrow that beam is relative to what we have in the, the SEM at, say, 1 kV. And then if we zoom in even further, we'll see in the top 5 nanometers that the beam is, is really just cutting a very sharp path 
through, through the top of the substrate. And that's going to allow us to really keep the secondary electron emission localized to where the beam enters. And that allows us to get this high resolution. So if we can keep that probe size to 0.5 nanometers, we're also going to get scattering that comes just from where it enters. And that's how we're getting those nice images that we're talking about. If we change the voltage of our helium ion beam from, say, 30 to 20 to 10, uh, then our interaction volume scales accordingly, so about 200 nanometers down here at 10 kV. And we can compare that to helium, neon, and gallium all at 30 kV. And we can see the stopping power of the material to gallium is higher. And so we have about 60 nanometers, 30 kV gallium in silicon, 150 for neon, and 500, as I said for helium. So when you're doing your ion microscopy, you want to keep in mind uh, the three dimensions over which the, the beam is scattering and damaging your sample. And we'll see some examples of why helium can be quite damaging to a material if you're trying to put a lot of dose into it to, for instance, mill away material. Uh, and here, the SRIM simulations uh, that we use for any ion species, any energy, we can kind of see what the size of the interaction volume would be. Then there's other groups out there that are formulating other simulation software, for instance, Invision and Ionize. Um, and so SRIM won't allow you to track an evolving surface. So we know we're sputtering away some material, but this is really only to show us the depth of penetration of the ions in the material. Um, you can look at this Ionize simulation software. They're, they're using that to, to actually uh, show an evolving surface as you sputter away material. Uh, and here, these are just some of the, the metrics of the beam. We talked about minimum probe size, 0.4 nanometers for helium, maybe about 1.5 for neon, 5 nanometers for gallium. We'll talk about the electron flood gun, where we're actually going to have a beam that's spread over millimeters. Uh, in our accelerating voltage range, about 10 to 35 for our GFIS species, 0.5 to 30 for gallium, and then we already covered the, diff the current range that we have here. Uh, and we won't go through all of this, but you have your handout that shows the alignments that you can do and the different visual cues that I tell you to look for when you're doing your alignments. And the good news is that we have videos on YouTube where you can watch these alignments take place and learn to do it by watching. OK, so now we'll do a lot of examples. And here we have uh, helium ion beam imaging first. So I showed this from the top, the difference between helium ion and scanning electron microscopy. So again, the great resolution and depth of field simultaneously that we have here with helium. This is an example, actually, where uh, I'll talk about the lithography that we did. But here you can see dramatically the difference in depth of field. This is scanning electron microscopy. These are really small lines. They're about 8 nanometers small. This is resist that's been patterned with an electron beam. And then we tilt it to about 87 degrees so that we can try to look down and see the, the roughness or the, uh, the line edge roughness on the side. But when we're using an immersion lens, we limit our depth of field. And therefore, we, the whole image kind of goes out of focus just within a couple hundred nanometers. Whereas with the helium ion microscope, we tilt these to 87 degrees. We're able to see that line edge roughness of the resist all the way down. This is a full micron wide and then, uh, or full micron long. And then we also have the line edge roughness after we've etched that resist. So we're going to go talk about the electron flood gun here for a few minutes. And uh, this is what you might get on this insulating, suspended silicon nitride waveguide in an SEM. And that's about the best I could do. I'm at low voltage and low current and short working distance, immersion mode, uh, versus what we could do with the helium ion microscope. And so we can see lots of these little dots and imperfections on it. And we're seeing uh, no charging artifacts. Like these are so-called so charging artifacts in our SEM. All right, so our electron flood gun is mounted to the back of the chamber. And here are some of the controls that we have for it. We can control 
the energy of the electrons, how, how long we flood electrons with every pulse that we make. We can steer the beam and, and uh, have a, we have a couple other parameters that we can control. I'll show a video explaining this. If we look at that flood gun in the chamber, it kind of comes in from the column here, and the electrons will flood again with a probe size of several millimeters over the full area of your sample. So here's an example of another silicon nitride waveguide. And there's two beams that are parallel. And as we zoom in with helium, they, they both build up positive charge, and they start to repel each other. Um, so this is with the flood gun off. And then we can do frame. We can pulse after each frame, but that doesn't do a whole lot. So we want to pulse with the electrons after each line. And if we're at like 200 EV energy, not much is happening. But if we go up to 400, we'll see they kind of start to snap together. So 400 EV electrons was enough to offset the positive charge of the incident ion beam. And then usually I go up to the highest energy, which is 1,000 EV. And then you can do other things, like we have line averaging on the system. So we can scan each line several times, after which each we get a pulse of electrons. And we can form this really nice image of what would otherwise be really difficult to, to image with uh, low KV electrons or, or high voltage or high energy ions. So it's this charge balance that we're using to, to get this nice image. All right, and this is another one of those waveguides. If we, if we look at the whole thing without the flood gun, then you notice it's dark. So what's happening is that we're building up positive charge, and it's holding on to the electrons, uh, and therefore uh, the, sec the secondary electrons that would otherwise be going to the detector. And so when you do that, it ac ends up being effectively like a black hole for secondary electrons. So you just get a, a dark image. When we flash with electrons, and balance the charge at the surface, we effectively liberate the secondary electrons from the surface. They can go to the detector. And now we can count them and show our image as it should look. If we were to zoom in, then without the flood gun, we can get lots of strange scanning and charging artifacts here. And then if we start flashing the uh, flood gun, we can get everything to sort of stabilize and get that image that I had shown earlier. So I mentioned that we pretty much always operate at 30 kV for imaging. There's one exception, and that's when you want to change the uh, opacity or transparency of your sample. So if you have a bulk specimen, 30 kV is great. All those helium ions are going to get embedded in the sample. Uh, but if we have a very thin membrane, then what happens is that, say, 30 kV, we get secondary electrons out the front, and then they'll also spill out the back. So you're going to get signal from multiple surfaces, and that ends up giving you what looks almost like a transparent image. This is, again, silicon nitride. So if we go down to lower and lower voltage and have that interaction volume smaller, we can ultimately confine the interaction volume to the, th the thickness of the membrane here is 200 nanometers. And now we only get secondary electrons out the front. And therefore, our image will look more opaque. That comes at a consequence, though, because we know at higher voltage and higher energy, we'll get a smaller probe size for better resolution. So this little metal component of the device, we get much sharper features there. And as we go down to low voltage, while the opacity is improved, we also get poor resolution on that metal section. Uh, you do have to be aware of some scanning and dose effects. So here I'm imaging some nanoporous gold. And these are 1,000 nanometer, one micron field of view. And if we zoom in on the different, uh, on a smaller section, one thing you'll see is there's some little wiggles in the beam. So this was just taken 50 microseconds per pixel in one frame. We can do what I said earlier, which is line averaging. So if we do eight lines times 6.5 microseconds, we get the same basically 50 microseconds per pixel. But now when we zoom in, we see that we don't have those same little wiggles in our image. So that's a nice way to uh, improve the resolution at highest magnification. 
um, but only goes so far because if we were to just actually have a 30 na 300 nanometer field of view and do the same dose, by the time we've actually captured the signal that's coming from it, we've eroded away the material with helium. Even though it has a small sputter rate, it's enough to actually change the material. So a better way to do that would actually be to use uh, less dwell time. Uh, so you would think less dwell time would be poorer signal to noise, but in this case it's going to be better in terms of not damaging the material. All right, so now some examples of milling. Uh, we have two different software platforms for scanning the beam, for doing lithography and, and milling. So this is what's called NPVE, uh, Nano Patterning and Visualization Engine from Fibix. And I'll show a video here in a second. This is what the software looks like. So uh, here's a quick demonstration where we capture an image uh, from coming over from the Zeiss software. We might draw a square and set the geometry, so 0.5 by 0.5 microns. We'll set the dose that we want here in nanocoulombs per micron squared, the dwell time at each pixel, the spacing between each beam shot, and how we want it to scan. So I'm setting it to double serpentine. And now it's going to scan, and you can actually watch this is the double serpentine as it goes up and down. Um, this is the neon beam, and so we're milling, I believe, aluminum here. And one thing you can see is the, the grayscale changing as a function of time. So something that is useful in this software is you can watch how the grayscale changes, and that can tell you maybe when you've broken through a layer and you're now into a different material. So this is called endpointing, and we can use this to stop the beam once we reach the next layer. When you mill with helium, you can cut really small features. As I said, uh, there's a 7 nanometer line, 10 nanometer line cut in aluminum. Uh, but if you, I'll show you that if we can't overdose it because we're going to have some problems. And here's an example of doing area milling on a perovskite material, where if you have too much dose, you actually can swell the material. And I'll show more dramatic examples of that in a moment. But if you get the optimum dose up here, it's just enough helium to etch away the 2D material uh, and not enough to cause the underlying substrate to swell. Uh, and here's the more dramatic version of that where you can actually blow bubbles in silicon. I think this is yeah, 50 picoamp beam, so that's considered a very high current beam for helium. And what happens is as the beam goes into the sample, you generate a lot of vacancies, and those vacancies uh, they can kind of pool together, and then the, the helium goes from an ion to a, it picks up an electron, and now it's back to being helium. And you can effectively just form a, a gas bubble of helium that blows up the silicon. You can cut through it with, say, a gallium focused ion beam and see that you really have a cavity inside of that silicon. And people have actually used this for, to do useful things like make microfluidic channels on the surface of a of a silicon chip. If you control the, the energy and the current just right, you can actually use this to do fabrication. And then over here, I'm showing that if you don't have your dose correct and you have organics on your sample, you actually will get net deposition of carbonaceous material versus net etching of that material. So it's very important to do oxygen plasma cleaning of your sample before attempting helium milling. OK, now here's an example of using helium to, to cut, as I showed earlier, graphene nanoribbons by exposing an array of rectangles. These are 60 nanometers, and people elsewhere have done smaller ribbons than that. Uh, here you can see the AFM image, the phase image, showing the difference in the, uh, the material where we've removed the, the graphene versus where we haven't. And it's not always about doing the smallest thing that you can do. We had a student who wanted to have a 34 nanometer gap that she cut with helium, and she did that in silver. And 34 nanometers was what her simulations showed would give her the right response on her device. And so she was able to dial up the right dose to give her this exact dimension, which would be a little more difficult to do that with, say, a gallium 
ion beam. We have another student who takes gold and she bisects it with neon and she can control that down to about 12, 14 nanometers. And she's ultimately using this for a field emission device where she gets electrons to jump across that small gap. And she's found that actually the neon beam is almost too good. If you do 12 nanometers, her devices blow up. So she actually scales it back to something like 16 or 17 nanometers. Here's another example of neon where you can do high aspect ratio milling. Uh, so you can make these kind of uh, cantilevers if you wanted to do mechanical testing. And you cut a notch, and then you, know, you press on the cantilever, and you study the fracture mechanics involved. If you do that with gallium, then at the end of the crack tip, you're going to alloy your metal. And that will change the, the fracture mechanics involved. So the idea using neon is that it's an inert species. And so if you have neon at the end of your crack tip, that's going to be uh, more, that's going to be preferential to having gallium there as the alloying element. And then because of this high depth of field that we have, this highly collimated beam, we're able to mill away material with high aspect ratios. There's a, a strange phenomenon that happens uh, with the neon beam, and we can actually split it into two beams. So the gas bottle of neon has about 90% of neon 20 and 9% of neon 22. And when you have ion getter pumps that are used to pump the system, to pump the columns, they have very large magnets, and that can create uh, a magnetic, magnetic moment that deflects the beams uh, away from each other. So the, the, uh, the, charge, the mass to charge ratio changes, and therefore our, our neon 20 and our neon 22 beam split. And on our system, we are able to measure that it's, it's about 17 degrees off axis. So you can cut a circle, and you can see how it, how it changes. And the way that we usually do that now to check it is we write this kind of fan pattern. And at 90 degrees down here, the split is pretty dramatic. And we're able to find that somewhere near 20, the split is in line with the rest of the beam. And then we can go to finer uh, angles and find that 17 degrees is really about where our split is in line. So if you want to do, if you want to cut a single line, like Lucia cutting those lines through gold for field emission, she actually ends up rotating her stage so that the cut that she'll make is in line with the beam split. Another thing you could do is we could remove the ion getter pumps while we're doing these uh, experiments. And other people around the world will do that. But we find for, for single pass lines like this, it's, it's sufficient to just rotate the stage in order to compensate. And then here you can see at higher magnification, our 17 nanometer line is the smallest. Um, this is to show that we have a second hardware system, a uh, second pattern generating system on our Orion. And this is by Wraith. So the first one I showed you is more for like placing patterns and cutting different shapes. And, and this is really more about doing lithography or automating your processes. So you might figure out what doses work well for you with that NPVE system. And then when you're ready to automate it over larger areas, and overnight, for instance, you might go and, and link it up with the what's called the Wraith Elfi system. So here you can see some specs. Sorry for the advertisement. But this is just some of the, the things that are uh, relevant, like their 16-bit their uh, DAX that they like to talk about. So I showed this earlier. Um, we did lithography. I think I mentioned earlier electron beam lithography, but this was actually helium lithography, and we just captured the images with secondary or with an SEM, and that's where we had the bad depth of field. But we're, I have a collaborator who has these metal organic resists. They're really high resolution negative tone resists. We were able to do about eight, eight nanometer features by using uh, the helium ion beam for lithography. And really, our lab at the KNI is, I like to think of it like a lithography lab. So you know, electron beam lithography kind of drives a lot of what we do in terms of device fabrication. And so what we've been trying to do with our system is figure out ways to make it more of a lithography tool. It's not always enough to be able to cut something really small, remove a tiny amount of volume. We want to be able to do large area patterning. 
And in order to do that, you have to be uh, imagina imaginative or inventive about using these beams for lithography. So helium ion beam lithography has been around for uh, 10, 15 years, and people have demonstrated really nice things like this. Uh, and then as I mentioned at the beginning, last year we did, uh, we made about five, six nanometer features in both silicon and tungsten. So these are, again, the smallest features that have been etched uh, in these sort of conventional lithography and reactive ion etching uh, techniques. And we also, the spacing is important. So the spacing here is only 17 nanometers apart. So when you hear about seven nanometer node for Intel, they're not really talking about seven nanometer fins, that we're really talking about something more on the order of spacings of 20 plus nanometers. So we're doing a little bit better than, than they're even planning to do for five or seven nanometer node. Uh, and another thing to mention is that when you do helium ion lithography, not only do you get high resolution, uh, but the, the secondary electron generation is so large that you can end up using much smaller doses than you would with, say, electron beam lithography. Uh, so we're usually about two orders of magnitude lower. And what that allows you to do is then take your current two orders of magnitude lower, and then we can take advantage of that really small probe size. So ultimately, the patterning time is about the same as you would have with e-beam lithography, but the resolution is what will ultimately be improved. Uh, and that works best for very thin resists. Like the trick here was this resist is only three nanometers, and it has a really high etch selectivity, which allowed us to, to etch 20 nanometer features. If you have hundreds of nanometers of PMMA, for instance, then it's not quite as effective as a high resolution lithography beam. But if you can have a, a very thin film for resist, then helium will be uh, a really good option for you. All right, now I just want to mention with this Wraith software, we can, uh, we can align to markers. So we can have, say, these four alignment markers, and then I have a target marker here. So we can either look in a manual mark scan mode, where we just look in windows and manually identify where the markers are, or we can do what are called auto mark scans. So we can do line scans across the two axes of these, of these markers. It'll find the center point of each of the four markers and then make the appropriate adjustments in rotation, in zoom scaling, and also shifting. And so what that allows you to do is if I want to cut across on this target marker, I was able to make a 10 nanometer gap in a thin film of titanium and have the placement accuracy also be on the order of about 10 nanometers. Uh, we don't have as great stitching here as you might have on our 100 kV EBPG systems for electron beam lithography. So a lot of what you do needs to end up being all in one field. So your alignment markers and your target are all going to be in the same field. But if you're able to do that, to do some patterning like this, then it's going to be really effective in terms of high resolution and high placement accuracy. Uh, I think I have one final example here. This is something I worked on with a couple of summer undergraduate students. And it's what we call neon-focused ion beam hard mask lithography. So the idea was we wanted to make a, a really long wire, like a four millimeter long wire, and fit it in a 20 by 20 micron area uh, to serve as an inductor for superconducting circuits. And we wanted to do it with aluminum. So when we tried it the first time, we wanted to just use neon, because it has a pretty small probe size. We thought, maybe we'll just cut the wire. Um, but in order to get through 60 nanometers of aluminum and sputter atom by atom, that full thickness of aluminum, to do a four millimeter long wire would take something like 25 hours. And these systems aren't stable over a time scale of 25 hours because that liquid nitrogen needs to be filled twice a day. So you'd have to pause every like eight, nine hours in order to set up the system. And really, there's other reasons why you probably wouldn't want to run neon for maybe more than an hour at a time. So this was sort of out. We weren't going to be able to do that. So we devised a system where we, or a strategy where we coated aluminum oxide, just a few nanometers, like 4 to 10 nanometers of ALD aluminum oxide, to serve as our hard mask. And then we used neon to pattern that hard mask. So instead of etching through 60 nanometers of aluminum, we're now etching through just a few nanometers of, of aluminum oxide. 
And then once we've done that, we can do reactive ion etch to take care of the rest of the, the etching. And so it can toggle between the first one where the lines are a little bit narrower when we just remove material with the direct etch versus the, the hard mask approach. But still, we're getting gaps on the order of 50 nanometers, pitch on the order of 125. And this reactive ion etch step is about 40 seconds. So you can pattern a full 4 millimeter wire in about 20, 25 minutes, and then do your reactive ion etch in 40 seconds. So this was the final uh, inductor that we made. We used the ELFI software and hardware to align to markers and put it in the middle of this aluminum pad. And then if we were to zoom in, we actually pattern it at about 100 nanometer pitch. So there's about a 50 nanometer gap and a 50 nanometer wide aluminum wire. If we look at it from above, we see this is what our, our wire looks like. So it's just a four millimeter continuous wire. And then here, about 40 nanometers width of aluminum and on 100 nanometer pitch. And so we did this primarily for aluminum, but we also were curious to see what you could do with silicon. So just putting a few nanometers on silicon, patterning it, and etching it allowed us to get fins that are about 25 nanometers wide spaced on a pitch of 45 nanometers. So this isn't quite as good as we did with helium lithography, where we did 17 nanometers uh, and 5 nanometer lines. Uh, but this is also something that can be used to uh, do large scale patterning, whereas otherwise you wouldn't want to use neon as a direct etching beam for, for such large volumes and areas. And the best we can do on uh, aluminum uh, with aluminum was about 75 nanometer pitch. But you get these nice high aspect ratio wires. All right, and I mentioned before that you do want to clean your sample. So we both have oxygen argon plasma cleaner in the lab, and we have a plasma cleaner on the system itself. So periodically, we will clean the chamber using that plasma cleaner. So when my student was working on these inductors, we noticed we were building up a lot of carbon on the perimeter of the pattern. And so after doing a chamber plasma clean, we were able to get uh, a much, much cleaner pattern. And the other thing you can see here is sort of the split beam. We had the main line and then the split line. Um, but when you do the hard mask lithography, you don't have to etch very long, so you don't end up seeing the split line interacting at all with your sample. So it's a good way to, to just avoid even having that split beam have any problems. OK, and then we also have gallium on the system. I'm not going to go through the whole thing. We had a whole lecture on gallium just to show that you can do your standard grayscale milling with bitmaps. You can cut cross sections, and then, as I showed earlier, image those cross sections with helium. And uh, you can do, do larger removal of volume. So if you want to mill an alignment mark onto your sample, then you can do that with gallium and then use that to align your helium or neon all in one run. So with that, I'll acknowledge the NSF grant that allowed us to obtain our Orion NanoFab a couple of years ago, and just mention that all this work was either done by k &I staff or, as I showed at the beginning, some, some people, other researchers from the, around the world. And then again, I'll point out that you have your handouts in front of you, so your, your concepts handout and your alignment handout. And the one slide I didn't put in here is sort of the electron flood gun. You can see when you have your ion beam, your flood of electrons. This is showing schematically what's happening in terms of those two interactions. So uh, I'll show you the alignment handout here, and I'll pause now for any questions that you have.